Now, Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, I Had an Alibi, starring Keenan Wynn. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you as star, Mr. Keenan Wynn, who is soon to be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production Between Two Women. Tonight, Mr. Wynn details for us the dramatic narrative of a gentleman who studied thoroughly the art of murder, and who, like certain others whose ventures are now and again recorded on the front pages of our newspapers, evolved his own formula for the perfect crime. And so with I had an alibi, and with the performance of Keenan Wynn, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Miss Lamson? Yes? Come in, come in. Sit down. Ever take dictation for a writer before? No. No. Well, that's okay. I've never written a novel before that I finished. I uh, hope you don't mind working in a place like this. I don't mind working anywhere that I'm paid to work. Oh, don't let that worry you. I came into quite a piece of change not long ago. Um, maybe you heard about it. Yes. Well, you're not exactly the talkative type, are you? I didn't think you'd have much time for talking, Mr. Eichner. <laughs> yeah, check. Eleven days to make my, uh, deadline. Uh, ready to start? Yes. Title, I Had an Alibi by Joseph Eichner. Oh, by the way, this will all be in the first person. Yes. <clears throat> Chapter one. I first met Belle Schaffner when I went to work for the Herald. She was a sob sister and a good one. I was a police reporter and, uh, no bum in the business myself. With Belle and me, it... It happened almost right away. We talked the same language, thought the same way, wanted the same things. We, we were that kind of a team. But for a while, there were a couple of notions in the back of my mind that I hadn't even told Belle. Because uh, sometimes a woman in love can be practical only just so far. It all came out one night in the office after I'd been there about six. Hi, Sugar Puss. Busy? Uh Uh-uh. Can I see? Eh, why not? Dimly through the gray curtain of fog, Alice saw the phantom figure. It was closer now. She tried to scream, but her throat... (laughs) Is Alice still having trouble with her throat? She's been trying to scream for two weeks now. Look, I know, I know. There's a reason right there. City desk, Eichner. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's the address again? Yeah, okay, I'll go right down. Oh, well, what did I tell you? President want to see you? Some guy carved up his wife. If I have to cover one more family brawl ends fatally for this sheet... Well, what's the matter? You like to write about murders, and here they pay you for it. Well, not the kind of money I want, they don't. Have you any idea what they pay a guy like James M. Kane? Mm, a James M. Kane girl never has any trouble screaming when she wants to. Now, you listen, Joe. You'll never write a decent book until you get down to something you know about. Well, this stuff sells, doesn't it? Agatha Christie sells. Leslie Charteris sells. Yeah, yeah, but that's not your racket, Joe. You've seen plenty of the real thing. Write about that. Stick to your trade. Oh, yeah. Well, look what it's got me. You just can't be a writer and a newspaper reporter at the same time, Belle. That's all. All right. Quit. <laughs> On what? Relief? Well, darling, it isn't leap year, but uh, I'll always support you. Oh, I, I can't even live on my own salary. How are we going to both live on yours? Oh, listen, Belle, 
You know how I am about you. Well, a girl always thinks she has ways of knowing. Well, I've given you plenty of ways of knowing. But before we do anything like that, we've got to have money. Lots of money. We're that kind of people. And uh, there are our ways. Like what? Well, like marriage, for instance. Oh, uh, you're going to marry the boss's daughter, huh? Well, why not? If the boss has left her a million dollars and uh, she has a bad cough... Well, I don't have a million dollars, but... <coughs> all right, you think I'm kidding. But they exist. You read about them in the papers all the time. That's right, you do. Well, what's that? Just a picture of a girl. Oh, uh -huh. what about her? I'm supposed to go out and interview her tonight. It's a very, very sad story. Yeah? Uh-huh. She's got not one million dollars, but five. And she's an orphan. And she's got something the matter with her heart. So they only give her six months to live. And she's just come out here to spend her last days in the glorious sunshine of California. It's a very sad story. Yeah. You want the assignment, Romeo? It's yours. Hmm? Oh, uh, say, loan me a couple of dollars, will you, Belle? What? Poker? Oh, no, no, no. Flowers. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Keenan Wynn, whom you've heard in the prologue to I Had an Alibi, a radio play by Mindred Lord. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. And we have an interesting idea for you tonight from the keen and sensible mind of America's famed expert on parties and smart entertaining, Miss Elsa Maxwell. And we quote, Serving a nice table wine when friends come to dinner or with everyday meals is one of the smartest, most sensible, and truly moderate pleasures of which I know. And one which any family can regularly enjoy since the cost of delicious Roma Burgundy is very little. Just serve your Roma Burgundy well-cooled. Enjoy it with any food, and don't worry about special glasses. Any glasses available are perfectly correct. The goodness of the wine, the added enjoyment of your food, these are the things that count. Miss Maxwell expresses perfectly what we of Roma believe. In Roma, California Burgundy, and all Roma wines... You enjoy the glorious color, aroma, and flavor of superb, sun-ripe grapes. Our noted wineries, located in California's choicest vineyard areas, assure you of flavor and quality which are always good, never varying, always delightful. And so, Roma quality is preferred everywhere. And you are able to enjoy these fine Roma wines at modest prices, only pennies a glassful. Remember... More Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage our star, Mr. Keenan Wynn, who, as one Joe Eichner, prepares to continue dictation on his first and only novel, I Had an Alibi, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You're, uh, sure you don't mind coming here, Miss Lamson? No. Well, we'd better go on with the dictation. I've only got, uh, nine more days. I'm ready. Uh, chapter four. Belle Schaffner was a good sob sister, all right, even if she did have one weakness, which was me. The story she'd given me about the girl was the real McCoy. Her name was Linda Vale, and she did have five million dollars and just six months to live. I went out to her house that night. She was living in a big place in Beverly Hills that she'd taken over from some broken-down movie star. You know, swimming pool, tennis courts, riding stables, the works. And not a soul around. I'd been worried about that. I, I thought maybe she might be having a last fling and working at it 24 hours a day, you know, with a lot of nosy spongers hanging onto her all the time. There was just one light on in a room upstairs and a hall light. I went up to the door and knocked and... Waited. Yes, sir? 
Uh, I'd like to see Miss Vale, please. I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Vale has given orders that... Well, would you just give her these, please? I'll, I'll wait. Oh, very well, sir. A uh, press card will break the ice with almost anyone, and I knew the flowers would do the rest. Oh, but it's a surprise. Pretty soon I heard steps and a voice. Sandy, the flowers are simply lovely, but who... Miss Vale? Yes? Well, my name is Joseph Eichner. <laughs> Yeah, she was a nice enough kid and lonely. Because, like a lot of people on a spot like that, the thing she was afraid of most was having anybody pity her. That's the mistake that nearly everybody made. But not me. I played it for a switch. I'd figured every move for days ahead. Joe? Yes? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. You've been awfully subdued lately. You've always been so... Gay. Well, Linda, I... Well, I've got to go away. Go away? Linda, I've been trying to keep it from you, but... Well, gee, you, you must know how I feel about you, and seeing you every day and knowing that... Oh, Joe. Well, it's not fair to you, Linda. And, well, I can't take it anymore. Joe. Yes? I don't want you to go. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to, Linda, but... Then promise me. Promise me you won't leave me. Just for the little time that's left. Oh, Linda. For my sake. All right, Linda. For your sake. After that, it was quick and easy. Three days later, we went to see her doctor, the best heart specialist in California. Dr. Lawson, you must be frank with us. Doctor, we're in love. I see. And we want to be married. Look, doctor, if I could make Linda happier, if I could give her... All the love and tenderness. Well, isn't it just possible... My boy, all that medical science can do is go on the basis of experience. We can't make certain prophecies. But on the basis of experience, the prognosis for Linda remains unchanged. But, Doctor, once you told me that anything is possible... And I say it again, my dear. Anything is possible. That's enough for me, Joe. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Do you, Joseph, take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife to have and to hold in sickness and health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, forsaking all others, until death do you part? I do. Do you, Linda, take this man to be your lawful wedded wife? Hello, baby. Oh, hello, Romeo. Oh, now, Belle, lay off, will you? I'm sorry. I, I'm just nervous, I guess. Well, is anything wrong? Well, uh, that ex-husband of mine is loose again. Well, what of it? What of it? You remember the song and dance he led me the last time, don't you? All right, so he gets rough. You just have him committed again, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. Belle. No, please. I don't feel like... Well, what's the matter? Well, what do you think? Oh, now, Belle, you know I come around here as often as I can. Sure. Sometimes as often as twice a week. Well, I see you other places. Anyway, I, I can't help it. And then when I do come, well, gee, you might at least... Hmm. All right, skip it. How's the writing coming along? Oh, I don't know. I just can't seem to get started. So you're not even getting that done. Well, how can I get down to work when all I'm thinking about is... Joe, how long is this going to go on? Well, how do I know? It's bound to happen soon. That's what you said a year ago. A year ago. But, Belle, it's all set. She made out the will in my name and everything. All we have to do is wait. Just wait for the... Part of hers to quit, that's all. Well, I'm tired of waiting. Now, what do you think of that? Well, what else can we do? If you mean what else can I do? There are a few guys around loose with five million bucks, too, you know. Oh, now, Belle. Oh, you... For all we know, she's liable to live to be a hundred. Now, that's impossible. A doctor said... Yes, that... and doctors have been wrong. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, you think you're a mystery writer. What do you mean by that? I mean... If you're supposed to be able to think up mysteries, start thinking one up. Oh. And don't think about it too long, either. Say, Belle... I mean it, Joe. Okay. Because I'm not going to wait like this forever. Okay. Well, that was when I first began to think about it. Then all of a sudden, I began writing again. Linda was a little surprised, but I kept right at it, and every so often I'd show her what I'd done. 
It was pretty terrible, but it didn't matter because nobody but her was ever going to see it anyway. After about two weeks of this, I was ready. That night I came out of the study and went into the drawing room. Hello there, darling. Working hard? Yeah. Uh, say, Linda, you want to do me a favor? Well, of course I do. Well, uh, you know the place in my story where Lillian pretends to commit suicide and leaves the note? Uh Uh-huh. Look, I suddenly thought, why not have the note reproduced right in the book as as though we're in her own handwriting? You know, uh, Exhibit A, you know, along with the map of the grounds and so on, hmm? Well, that would be good. Yeah. Only, of course, it's got to be in a woman's handwriting. Do you want to write it for me? You mean my handwriting's going to come out in a book? Oh, how exciting. Well, it sure is if I can get a publisher, and I think I've got a nibble. Here, uh, you can write it on your own stationery. Right. I'll, I'll cut that letter head off the top later. All right. What does it say? Uh, darling. Darling? You, uh, you, you know I can't go on like this. Huh? It's, it's got to end sometime. It's got to end some time. Uh, it will be easier for both of us. If I end it now. If I end it now. Please try to forgive me and uh, sign it L. L? Wouldn't you sign it? Oh, no, no. You see, all Lillian's letters to Dick are signed L, remember? Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. There. Oh, thanks, darling. Is it all right? Oh, sure. It's perfect. Hello, Belle? Yeah. Now, listen, baby, it's all set. Did you get the note? Oh, sure, sure. She wrote it tonight. Now, how soon can you leave for Palm Springs? Anytime. Tomorrow morning? All right. Now, listen, when you check in down there, make plenty of fuss about it. I will. Uh, I'll leave here at exactly 9.30 tomorrow night. I'll stop at a couple of places, so you leave Palm Springs about uh, 15 minutes later, oh, 9.45. Okay. Better check your watch at Western Union. I'll do the same. Okay. Hey, be sure to bring plenty of stuff, everything you can lay your hands oh, on. Oh, don't worry. I will. You remember the place, don't you remember? You know, the second turn after you leave Riverside. Well, how far is it about? Well, it's exactly halfway between the springs and here. Say, 60 miles. I'll be there. Okay, baby, tomorrow night. What time is it, Linda? Oh, it's just about 9.30. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Gee, darling, I hate to have to leave you this way on such short notice. It's all right, dear. I'll be going to sleep in a few minutes anyway. You know, I don't know why this guy has to see me in such a rush in Palm Springs, of all places. But if he wants to publish my book... Of course, you have to go. Well, I'll be back tomorrow afternoon, uh, maybe even earlier. You won't worry, will you? No, I won't. Uh, Doors onto the terrace locked? Yep. Yeah, they're all right. You know, I know how nervous you are sometimes when I'm away for the evening. I think you're the one that's nervous. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, maybe I am at that. Well, good night, darling. Good night, Joe. Oh, uh, Saunders. Yes, sir? Come in, sir. Look, Saunders, I've got to drive down to Palm Springs tonight. Uh, Oh, excuse me just a second. Linda? Yes? Linda, you'd better put the snap lock on your door from the inside, just in case. I've got the key. Oh, Oh, all right. Here you are. Okay, darling, good night. Good night. Uh, Saunders, uh, let me see. Oh, yes. Uh, I wonder if you'd mind checking the doors from Mrs. Eichner's room onto the terrace to see if they're locked uh, from the outside. Good, sir. A little later when she's asleep so as not to disturb her. You know, she gets nervous sometimes when I'm not here. Yes, sir. Uh, Saunders, you won't forget, will you? Oh, no, sir. I shan't forget, sir. Uh, five gallons? Yes, sir. Say, uh, that ought to get me to Palm Springs. Oh, it should easy. By the way, have you got a road map for Palm Springs? I think I got one inside here. Oh, thanks. Say, I don't suppose you'd cash a small check, would you? I missed the bank today. Well, the boss might, but uh, he ain't here. Well, I got identification, plenty of it. See, Joseph Eichner... 
license, social security card, mm. Joseph Eichner. Yes, yes, I see, son, I see. But unless the boss was here, I wouldn't cash a check for Henry Morgenthau. <laughs> Bell? Joe. Hello, baby. Well, what's the matter? You're shaking all over. Oh, I don't know. Everything, I guess. Hmm? And I thought I saw that ex-husband of mine down in Palm Springs what? today. Now, what would he be doing down there? I don't... Oh, I must be seeing oh, things. Oh, I'm sure you are. Oh, Joe. Joe, I'm scared just the same. Are you sure nobody's going to get nosy about this? Let him. It's a setup. The room's locked from the inside, and the butler knows it. Nobody could have done... What's going to happen in that room tonight except Linda or me? I couldn't have done it because I couldn't be there in at Palm Springs with you at the same time, right? Oh, yeah, I and guess so. I've already left a trail to Palm Springs a mile wide. Did you get away all right? Yeah, off the back of the hotel. Nobody saw me. Everything else go okay? Oh, yeah. I got the maid in this afternoon and raised a fuss. Then I gave her $5 and made her polish everything till she was blue in the face. She'll never forget it. <laughs> Swell. You got the stuff? Yeah, my big suitcase in the trunk rack. All packed in cotton. Okay, let's take a look at it. Here you are. Look at this. Mm -hmm. Glasses, mm -hmm. water pitcher, ashtrays. And look at this. I even got doorknobs. I unscrewed them with a nail file. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> Here's the one to the bathroom. Now, this little one's from the medicine cabinet. Uh -huh. And this one's the inside of the front door. Okay, I'll just put my fingerprints on them and you pack them back in cotton. Uh -huh. Say, you're sure you can get this stuff back into your room all right? Oh, sure. Well, better hurry then. Yeah, I know. There. With my fingerprints on that doorknob, just let anybody try to prove I wasn't with you in Palm Springs tonight. Oh, I told you that when you got down to something real, you'd hit the jackpot. Remember? Yeah, and you know what this pot is worth, don't you? Five million dollars. <laughs> no hitches. I got back to town a little before two. I drove the car into a little side road about a half mile up the canyon and walked back. I didn't meet anybody, and the places I passed were all dark. So was mine. I slipped through a hole of the hedge and crossed the lawn and went up onto the terrace. I checked to see if I had the suicide note in my pocket, and then I pulled on a pair of gloves and opened the terrace door with my key and went inside. The gun was in my overcoat pocket. It was hers. I had the flashlight in my hand. I went over to the bedside and I flashed it on just for a second. She was lying on her side, turned away from me. I put the gun against her temple and pulled the trigger. She didn't make a sound. I reached over to put the gun in her hand and then it hit me. Her hand was stiff and cold as ice. I flashed the light in her face. It was blue. While I was away, she'd had her heart attack at last. For the last three or four hours, she'd been dead. Well, for about ten seconds, I didn't know what to do. Then I realized I had to get out of there. Saunders might have heard the shot. Before, it wouldn't have mattered one way or the other because the coroner would have established the time of death anyway. But now it made all the difference in the world. I went out the terrace door and I locked it behind me. I... I crossed the grounds and I started walking up the canyon, walking, thinking. I, I don't know how long I walked, but what I was thinking was enough to drive me crazy. I'd planned the perfect suicide. I'd planned it so nobody could have fired that shot but Linda or me, and I had a perfect alibi. But now it had to be me that shot her, because any fool of a doctor could tell she'd been dead when that shot was fired. And then it came to me. What was the difference? Let the Palm Springs alibi go. Let him think the shooting was an accident. Let them think anything they wanted to. I had the money. And what can you do to a man for shooting a dead body? It was almost daylight when I got back to the room. The house was still dark, so Saunders hadn't heard anything. Well, first I burned that suicide note. Then I turned on the lights and unlocked the door. <laughs> Then I fired another shot into the wall for Saunders again, just in case he was awake. Then I went over to the interhouse phone. Uh, hello? 
Saunders. Oh, oh, yes, sir. Saunders, there's been an accident. You better call the police. <clears throat> well, uh, have you seen everything you want to, Lieutenant? Yep. Well, you're living kind of different than you used to when you were a police reporter downtown, huh, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, suppose you want to ask me some questions. Oh, a couple. I, uh, hear you were going to Palm Springs last night. Yeah, I was. I changed my mind. Who were you going to see down there? Anybody in particular? Oh, just a friend. It, uh, it wouldn't have been your old friend, Bell Shaffner, would it? Well... Whatever, I didn't go. Uh, you'd have had time to go, though. Well, all right, but I didn't. Anyway, what's all that got to do oh, with nothing, it? nothing, nothing, nothing. Just routine. So you came back here. Yeah, that's right. Then what happened? Well, I came in the house, and I went up to the our bedroom, and I, I thought I heard a noise. I thought I saw a man moving around. And, well, I was pretty jumpy, and I fired. How many shots? Two. And one of them hit your wife? One of them hit... What was my wife? All an accident, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You, uh... You come into quite a lot of money with her out of the way, don't you, Joe? Yeah, sure. What of it? Nothing. Only it's too bad you're not going to be able to spend it. <laughs> oh, nuts. What do you think you're going to do? Charge me with a murder for firing a shot into a corpse? No. But it could be a pretty spectacular little alibi for just on the spur of the moment, couldn't it? Alibi for what? For Belle Shaftner. What? Her throat was cut in Palm Springs last night, and your fingerprints are all over the place. It was her ex-husband who killed her, of course. But what's the difference now? Bella was right about one thing, though. You can't write a decent story unless it's something real. I know. The end. Well, Miss Lamson, we made it. Just. Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. <laughs> Gee, that's funny. Nobody else did. The judge, the jury. Not even my own lawyer. Maybe they believed what I believe. But you ought to die for it anyway. <laughs> yeah, check. Uh, I got a date for that right now. Right, Warden? You ready, Agner? Yeah, yeah, let's go. And so closes I Had an Alibi, starring Keenan Wynn, tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. The other day, Elsa Maxwell told us about a friend who had lived many years in wine-loving countries around the world. I gave him some of our delicious Roma California Burgundy at dinner, and he confessed to me that he thought it every bit as enjoyable as any he had ever had. So I say, you people who do not regularly serve Roma wine are missing one of the most delightful treats daily living can offer. It's so good, so smart, and yet so very simple. Take Miss Maxwell's advice. Enjoy Roma wine regularly. It's always good, unvaryingly fine in flavor and quality, and only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wines. Next Thursday, same time, Miss Nancy Kelly will be your star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>